Lippi, Windhunde, Zähne, Lehrer und Fertig, Kruppstahl. Your signature, and we'll be out of your way. You guys have a good day. Freedom itself is transforming the globe. After the collapse of the Soviet Union, it seemed there was an inevitable march toward freedom worldwide. Planet Freedom. Citizens would no longer have to fear their government. But now, things have changed. All right, there he is. Take some shots. Okay, FNG, you know what we're doing here? We're establishing POL, pattern of life. When he comes, when he goes, what door he comes out of, what time he comes to work, what time he goes home. meeting first thing he does in the morning everybody's got dirt just a matter of finding it I wanted to team up with someone who's been on the inside 
Dan Bongino is a former NYPD officer and Secret Service agent, and now a successful political commentator. You know, Dan, I'm really glad we're getting together because it seems to me like this is not the America that you grew up in. It's not the America that I came to as a teenager in the late 1970s. For the first time in my life, I'm saying to myself, am I going to get a knock at the door? FBI warrant, come to the door now! So is this the America I grew up in? Hell no, it isn't. It's not even close. It may be the Russia other people grew up in, but not my America. We're the free world. Then you have the unfree world, and that's North Korea, that's East Germany, that's the Soviet Union, that's China. Right. And why are we the free world? Because we have free speech, and we have equal rights under the law, and they don't. But now, suddenly, all those distinctions seem to be getting blurred. We have FBI folks spying on President Trump, and we find out intelligence officials may have been looking in and using databases to spy on other Americans. I mean, <laughs> you start to ask yourself, uh, is this freedom just some kind of illusion? When I think of police states around the world, there are so many features that seem now to be part of American life. Censorship, for example, political targeting, going after the leader of an opposition party. There are some elements that we don't see here yet. Typically, police states are established by some revolutionary overthrow of the government. Police states typically have a Berlin Wall. They prevent you from leaving. How far down the road are we? We're in the slow death version. Version is the most dangerous kind. They just get used to the evaporating civil liberties. Oh, this is normal being banned in the new public sphere. There are going to be ordinary Americans who are not that political, and the FBI hasn't banged on their door. In their America, there is no right. threat, there is no police state. Sure. We have to investigate how far down this road we've come. I don't think we have to investigate, I think we're obligated to. Is America becoming a police state? To find out, I spoke with politicians and journalists. Government told American citizens they couldn't go to church on Sunday in America. But the real scary thing is what we saw come out of the Richmond office of the FBI. It's if you're a pro-life, pro-family Catholic, they define you as radical. Republicans are prosecuted for crimes the Democrats are let go for. We don't have the overt tanks and machinery and weaponry going down Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. The, the way light. the Soviets did. Right, exactly. That was a more overt style police state, but that doesn't mean we don't have the onset of one here in America now. I think sometimes people have the imagery that people are going to be goose-stepping down the street wearing uniforms with swastikas. No. It's usually the faceless bureaucrat who's working in the basement somewhere who is carrying out the larger purposes that have been established by powerful leaders. Dozens of FBI armed agents with bullhorns outside of your home to terrorize your neighborhood as well as terrorize you, shock you out of sleep, drag you out of your house half clothes, refuse to give you a warrant, ransack your house, take you to the FBI field office where you're interrogated and don't even have a chance to access an attorney. I met with whistleblowers from the various police agencies of the government. We don't need to have a crime. What we need is a person to look at, and then we go find out what crime you did. A domestic intelligence service serves one master, the government that pays them. It does not serve the American people. And heard from ordinary Americans who have experienced the long arm of the federal government. We're living in very difficult, very perilous times. This is a police state now. They have full authority. They've weaponized the DOJ over and over and over again. How many more times do they have to do it before you recognize you're next on the chopping block? If we're such a police state, how do you explain the rampant riots that were allowed to occur under the banner of Black Lives Matter? How do you explain the dilapidated state of utter criminality in San Francisco, New York, Philadelphia, and all of our other cities? How is that consistent with us being a police state? It's very simple. The regime allows pure anarchy, zero consequences for its client populations, and the regime visits extreme tyranny on those it deems to be political enemies, namely law-abiding conservatives. Clearly, many conservatives believe America is becoming a police state. 
I wanted to get the perspective of someone who's actually lived in a totalitarian police state. Yeonmi Park is a refugee from North Korea. So I was born in North Korea in 1993. In a way, I was abducted at birth by the state. You are a slave, the, the state owns you, and they control you in every aspect. So even I'm a North Korean, I'm not allowed to travel inside North Korea, not to mention uh, travel abroad, and they don't even tell us how many countries exist in the world. I've never seen a map of the world. We don't even know the word freedom. So there's a single individual who represents the state. He is a beyond God. He is the nation, and he is the only reason why we exist, to serve him. And the crime of not respecting him, his picture on the newspaper, you read that by mistake. That's how you send to prison camp in North Korea, and you get executed. So by the time when I was 15 years old, we met missionaries from South Korea. They were risking their lives to rescue us. So after five years in South Korea, I came to America in 2015. You come to America, you're enrolled at Columbia University, and you ran into some things you didn't expect. I still vividly remember my professor saying that all the problems that we have in the world is because of greedy capitalism and because of white men. They say math is racist. Math was created by white men to control minority. The only solution for, to all these problems is us tearing down the constitution and rebuilding the nation in the name of equity, which is collectivism in North Korea. And, and you recognize right away that that's what he was talking that's about. That's what my North Korean teacher taught me in North Korean class. And it was the exact same thing, the anti-American, anti-freedom, anti capitalism, anti-free market. In North Korea, my teachers were telling me, enemies are everywhere. They're under the ground, they're the, in the air that we breathe, they're in the cave, in the sky. So the propaganda of North Korea was being echoed in the Columbia orientation. They went even further, in North Korea at least, that we believed what woman and man was. And then my professor were telling me one day, like, you can be a man. And I said, like, I cannot be a man, you know? I, I just became a mother at the time, like, I know I'm a woman, and she said, like, you're brainwashed. So in a way, Colombia was even crazier than North Korea. Yeonmi Park agrees that America, land of the free, is moving away from freedom. But is this really a debate over whether America is becoming a police state? No, the debate is over who is driving the police state. If you ask the left... He is literally trying to create an intelligence police state. How many books have been banned here in Texas? These draconian authoritarian laws to criminalize access to abortion instantly. In 1930s Germany, right? They went after trans and gay people first. Donald Trump is openly running a campaign on autocracy. He's essentially running for office on the idea of turning the presidency into a dictatorship. In this view, Republicans are trying to establish a police state and take away freedom. Who's right? We can answer this question by exploring what a police state is, how it got started, how it operates, and who's in charge. The Patriot Act has proved essential. I think one of the interesting questions, Dan, is the genealogy, the story of how this police state developed. When did it really start? If you're concerned about the police state, you're very concerned about what happened in Ruby Ridge. On August 21st, 1992, federal marshals shot my son Samuel in the back and killed him. Sam was just 14 years old. The marshals who killed Sammy were grown men. They were in combat gear. They were carrying machine guns and large caliber semi-automatic pistols. One day after Randy Weaver lost his only son, he and Kevin Harris were shot by an FBI sniper on August 22nd. Vicki Weaver was shot and killed while standing behind this door with baby Elisheba in her arms. Just seven months after Ruby Ridge, there was the tragedy at Waco. Yeah, there's 75 men around our building and they're shooting at us. And tell them there are children and women in here and to call it out. The fierce gun battle has led to a standoff between law officers and occult members of a religious compound outside of Waco this evening. More than 80 people are believed to have died in yesterday's fiery conclusion to the 51-day siege. 
24 of them children. President Clinton says he gives his full support to the decisions made by the Attorney General and the FBI to end the siege. Many Americans supported the government's actions at Ruby Ridge and Waco in the belief that those were fanatics, cult members, not like us. Today, however, the same rhetoric is used to describe one half of the country. That brings us to the pivotal moment the police state got its start. I think if you had to give it one moment in the flip from what was previously a constitutional republic to a police state, I got to give it to the Patriot Act. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. That looks like a second plane. The Patriot Act just turned us loose. We're going to expand the Bureau from law enforcement to domestic intelligence. Legal shackles are now off. Informants, Easy money. spies, wiretaps. We can do anything we want. Seems like a turning point for the emerging police state was the aftermath of 9-11. There were many people, me included, who thought that many of these powers given to government of surveillance, of tracking people and so on, were legitimate. You were one of the few people who warned, even then, that this was giving the government power that could be misused, could be abused, could be turned on American citizens who are not terrorists, and you were right. Those were my thoughts, but the most prominent person here in Washington was probably my dad, Ron Paul, who said that basically your fear of terrorism, your granting of these powers will someday be used against American citizens, not against terrorists. If you give us your liberty, we'll give you security. And people said, here's our liberty, here's our liberty. And they said, well, you'll never use it against Americans, right? John, in 1978, the FISA law right. established these so-called FISA courts. And the idea was, consistent with the American system, checks and balances. If you are going to do surveillance on somebody, you need to go to a court and get authorization to do that. After 9-11, all of the barriers that were constructed between counterintelligence and criminal investigation were removed. The FBI overstepped its authority in conducting investigations against American citizens. The FBI misused a popular digital surveillance tool on everyday Americans more than 278,000 times in 2020 going into 2021. Something seems to have happened to the FBI of late. 9-11 happened to the FBI when George Bush, 43, called Bob Mueller up to Camp David. He said, Bob, I know you're going to catch them, but what are you going to do to stop the next one? And that was the beginning of the police state that we're in. So suddenly the FBI is not saying, these are the bad guys, this is the bad stuff they've done, and we've got to go hold them accountable, but rather let's identify the bad guys who potentially could commit future crimes and let's find out about those crimes before they happen. I had a front row seat to this in Boston. Rezwan Ferdows, an American, developed a hatred of the United States, calling it evil. This young man was incapable of backing his car down the driveway, and he hatched a plan to, to bomb the Pentagon, but he had neither the intellectual or financial resources to do this, but we were right there to help him buy the materials he need, help him acquire the explosive material. Among the six counts for Dowse is now charged with attempting to destroy a federal building and attempting to provide material support to terrorists. We're walking that line of entrapment, and he's in jail today. This guy was a big talker, maybe even a terrorist wannabe, but not a terrorist. The FBI made him a terrorist and then foiled the plot that never was going to be carried out. These people are so down and out oftentimes. They're so in desperate need of a friend. The source or the FBI undercover is their friend and they don't want to let that person down. So they're willing to carry out the terrorism activity because they don't want to say no. How do you, how do you get close to this guy? Well, it's kind of, uh, you know, in a way, it's like acting in a movie to, to be a method actor, to be able to convince him. Do you find it hard to believe the FBI would frame people as terrorists who are not terrorists? I on me. Consider the case of the Liberty City 7. Classified young subject. I on me. Narsil Batiste, a cash-strapped religious seeker, thought he'd found the perfect con. Robes and cane walking your way, eyes on you. He tricked an Al-Qaeda operative to give him money to do a terrorist act that he had no intention or ability to carry out. He's one of the stairs towards the moon. 
Yes, this is an extremely dumb idea. But this... And the guy is definitely a scam artist. Little did he know that the operative was not Al-Qaeda. He was an FBI informant posing as an Al-Qaeda guy. Yep. Video's live. Audio? Yeah. What do you want from me? I'm exhausted, financially. You need money? Yes. How much? 50 grand? Ooh. For what? You want me and my network to give you $50,000? For what? Uh, boots. Boots. Boots? Artillery. Uh, artillery? Oh, come on. Are you kidding me? Hand pistol machine guns. Uh, okay, come okay. Um, okay. Okay. Really? What is all this for? To get that kind of money, it has to be big. Bigger than 9-11? The tall building in Chicago. The, what is it called? Uh, Sears Tower. Yes, the Sears Tower. Hacker with so much explosives. The it'll... <laughs> wow. It'll be so big. It'll fall into the water and, and like a tsunami hit the rest of Chicago. How many people are we talking? A million? Yeah, yeah, like a million. Okay. Before I give you this money, we need you to take a pledge, an oath to Al-Qaeda. Just say the words? Repeat after me. God's pledge is upon me, and so is his compact. God's pledge is upon me, and so is his compact. I will be a soldier, of the Islamic soldiers until death. I commit myself to jihad. <clears throat> I will be a soldier of the Islamic soldiers until death. I commit myself to jihad. Congratulations, my brother. Uh, so I guess that makes him Al-Qaeda. It's an endangered to society. What I do, I turn away from the side of my voice. You got the wrong guy. I didn't do We're gonna the work it out, okay? We're gonna work it out. Batiste didn't want the money to commit a terrorist act. He needed money for his struggling construction business. Just put your nuts, put them away. Good. You know the drill. Informants can get tens, even hundreds of thousands of dollars to entrap their targets. They get even more if their targets are convicted. Thank you, sir. Batiste and his co-conspirators attempted to obtain the support of Al-Qaeda and taking the oath of allegiance to Al-Qaeda. Batiste, the ringleader of this group, intended to recruit and supervise individuals to organize and train for a mission of war against the United States. Absolutely ridiculous. The real story here is Batiste tried to pull a scam on Al-Qaeda and the FBI pulled a bigger scam on him. Narsil Batiste got 162 months in prison, followed by 35 years of supervised release. I think as a former police officer and federal agent, you always have to ask yourself that question. Would this crime have happened if not for the intervention of this specific mechanism that we're doing right now? And if the answer is no, then your job is to back off in a constitutional republic. Under Bush, we saw these tools used against Muslims. But Obama took it to a whole new level. He turned the state against Republicans and conservatives. Hello, IRS, federal agent. We have a search warrant. Revelations that the IRS has been targeting conservative groups like the Tea Party for extra scrutiny. The IRS was also tracking groups whose goals included, quote, limiting government, and educating on the Constitution and Bill of Rights, and even groups that, quote, criticize how the country is being run. Obama also used his DOJ to go after his political opponents, something I experienced firsthand. D'Souza pleaded guilty in 2014 to campaign finance fraud in connection with an illegal contribution to the 2012 Senate campaign of a person named Wendy Long. Just weeks before all this went down, 
uh, I released uh, a movie in the theater. It was a very emotionally damaging movie to Obama. No American in this country's history has been prosecuted, let alone locked up, for doing what I did. It used to be Islamic terrorism. That threat has kind of dissipated. You now have these large apparatuses that have these capabilities. Good morning, fellow federal employees. I got the chatter from your boss at headquarters. Thank you. Need that power view in two hours. Yes, sir. Good morning. Good morning. You need to create a demand for your services. And one of the ways in which these government agencies are doing it is by changing their mission. They're moving from what used to be domestic terrorism to domestic extremism. We elevated racially and ethnically motivated violent extremism to our highest threat priority on the same level with ISIS. And they're looking at extremism in a way that really paints anybody who's right of center as part of this sort of continuum. There's a, a, a document here, let me show you. Pretty amazing because it's called the Pyramid of Far-Right Radicalization. This was put together by a contractor for the Department of Homeland Security. And they talk about how one goes from being sort of a normal, regular, conservative, center-right person to an extremist. So at the lowest rung on this chart, you have Fox News, you have the Republican Party, you have Christian Broadcasting Network, you have the National Rifle Association. But that morphs into Breitbart, PragerU, Turning Point. A rise of political extremism, white supremacy, domestic terrorism that we must confront and we will defeat. You dehumanize someone, basically, so you can ruin them or kill them. Based on their political views. Do you have any doubt that inside the bowels of these interagency task forces that they have developed watch lists and censorship lists and target lists and maybe even kill lists? Oh, I, th there's no question in my mind that lists like this exist. Investigate Russian interference in the 26th. One signature element of the police state is that it's a one party state. Effective opposition is eliminated. When candidate Trump came down the escalators at Trump Tower in 2015, the government had a meltdown because they were like, wait a second, we don't want him to be president. Trump's a unique threat to this entire parasitic organism we call the deep state. Trump does not need the deep state, nor has he been brought up in this bureaucratic or political process where he's been taught to shut his mouth and sit down. He doesn't need the donors. He doesn't need their money. And he's certainly not there to be famous. He was one of the most famous men in the world before. He doesn't have the built-in emergency break and fear mechanism they've coached into every politician. Everyone else has the leash on, and he's just, you know the dog that doesn't want to get leashed? That's Trump. He doesn't want to get leashed, and he's not going to be leashed, and that's a real threat to them. Earlier today, I outlined my contract with the American voter. At the very top of the list is one of the most important promises of all. If I'm elected president, we are going to drain the swamp in Washington, D.C. We'll see about that. You take on the intelligence community, they have six ways from Sunday at getting back at you. But I think what's really convinced people, and we're actually the vast majority of Republicans now agree with what my father said, was when they discovered that the Patriot Act and FISA and these secret courts were used against Donald Trump. The last person she wants to run against is me. And I know that from her people. I know All of this came fact. about because of FISA. All you had to do was fool the amateurs in the black robes. And the FBI was able to spy on a presidential candidate in favor of another presidential candidate. I mean, think about Russiagate, in which Carter Page was singled out as a target for a counterintelligence operation. The FBI obtained a FISA warrant uh, on Carter Page, a Trump campaign advisor. It was really a way of going after the Trump campaign, later the Trump presidency. You have the FBI and DOJ saying, oh, we're not going after Donald Trump, we're going after Carter Page, because we all now know that if you go after someone in their orbit, you get everybody else. Because they thought by surveilling him, they would collect information to fill their fantastical stories. Trump peeing on girls. Vladimir Putin is holding something over Donald Trump. A Trump victory is a gift to Vladimir Putin. 18 reasons 
Trump could be a Russian asset. They were hoping for some phone call or some email or some recording between him and Putin or some other thing to say, look, we told you so, which of course would have been leaked to the media. You gave information to a friend mm -hmm. so that friend could get that information into the public media. Correct. I think the Russiagate playbook is the playbook that the Democrats created and they've just replicated. You just take out the word Russiagate and you put in COVID origins. You take out COVID origins and you put in Hunter Biden's laptop. You take that out and you put in January 6th. It's the replicated play from the deep state police state actors and their partners in the media. Trump's presidency was such an obstacle to the left and its desire to build a police state that they decided never again. FBI. But Democrats and the left had a problem. For Biden to win the 2020 election, voters must not learn about the elaborate corruption ring of the Biden family. This is it. This is it. Everything's on here? It's all in. The FBI took possession of Hunter Biden's laptop 11 months before the 2020 election. The laptop showed the perversions of Hunter Biden, but it showed a lot more. The corrupt dealings involving Joe Biden and the entire Biden family. The police agencies of government acting on behalf of the Bidens moved to suppress public disclosure of the contents of Hunter Biden's laptop. The FBI, I think, basically came to us. Uh, some some folks on our team. It was like, hey, you should be on high alert. There was the, we we thought that there was a lot of Russian propaganda in the 2016 election. We have it on notice that basically there's about to be some kind of dump. So just be vigilant. Twitter, Facebook, they're all privately owned, and I think we've got no business telling them what to put up. If they want to censor us privately, they really actually do have that right to do it. But there is no right by the FBI to collude with them. Or any agency of government. Or any matter. agency of government. They, the FBI, the police, were telling Twitter what to and not to put out. And so with Hunter Biden's laptop, which I think is the ultimate example of rigging a presidential election by suppressing the truth, these individuals have historically commissioned the biggest propaganda play in U.S. history. Was that your laptop? For real, I don't know. I know, but, but you know that's this I is I really a... don't know okay. the answer. Could be that it was the that it was Russian intelligence. This looks like Russian intelligence. This walks like Russian intelligence. This talks like Russian intelligence. You mean the laptop is now another Russia, Russia, Russia hoax? And that's got exactly it. what is this that's where exactly you're going? what this is going. where he's going. And the media is able to attach that line of effort, that sort of M.O., to its government police state operators and say, we'll just say Hunter Biden's laptop is Russian disinformation. 50 former intelligence officials signed on to a letter yesterday saying that the New York Post story about Hunter Biden's emails has, quote, all of the classic earmarks of a Russian disinformation campaign. These aren't nobodies that signed the 51 Intel letter. Former Secretary of Defense, former director of the CIA, former director of the National Security Administration. These are top level Some career. of them Republicans. Some of them Republicans who came out and said it had the hallmarks of Russian disinformation. Hey, I, I got something here. I think the big guy's gonna, gonna want to know about this. Police agencies like the FBI, CIA, Homeland Security, with the help of the media, buried the story that would have tipped the election. 
Then they rigged the election, as I pointed out in 2000 Mules. But they still needed to stop Trump from ever running again. So the next step was to try to lock him up. Trump takes documents from the White House to Mar-a-Lago. And then suddenly there is an FBI raid. Well, the FBI fabricated a criminal case. There is no crime with the president having presidential papers after leaving office, whether classified or unclassified. It is unclear how quickly the president should give those to the archives, and that's what was under discussion. But a criminal case was open. Why is that important? Because it then allows them to do a search warrant. They were looking at President Trump's 40 Wall Street property. They looked at the Seven Springs property. They looked at the Jupiter golf course. They looked at his apartment. They looked at his tax records. They looked at his financial statements. They looked at his kids' stuff. I mean, they looked at everything. It then allows them to try to get obstruction of justice on Trump because we have a proceeding that can be obstructed. If there is no criminal proceeding, he can't obstruct it, can he? Joe Biden, at the same time, took classified documents from his days as vice president. Apparently, some of those documents go back to his days in the Senate. You think that the documents were part of Biden's global influence peddling operation. When Hunter Biden was trying to sell the Ukraine oligarchs on his services, he provides an analysis of energy in the Ukraine area. When you read it, you know that he's getting it from an intelligence briefing. And I think he did it precisely so someone would say, ah, Hunter Biden really is in the know. The committee is concerned by the complicated, suspicious network of over 20 companies we have identified the Bidens and their associates used to enrich themselves. How does this family racket operate? Joe Biden himself was not the recipient of these funds. It was offshored. It was given to family members, tens of millions of dollars that had been funneled to the Bidens from foreign entities in places like China, Ukraine, and Russia. And there is no discernible business service that the Biden family performed for those funds. What service was being provided by the Bidens? What was the work they were doing? What was the value they were adding? What was the legitimate business? What was the business? Hunter Biden and his former business partner, Devin Archer. He considered Hunter Biden to be a lobbyist who leveraged a very powerful name to score millions in deals with foreign businessmen. He was aware of Hunter's business. He met with Hunter's business partners. There are 170 suspicious activity reports, and these reports are put together by the Treasury Department. There's something that raises the Treasury Department's suspicion about the banking transactions that were going on. Money moving into LLCs and then being paid to the Bidens, money moving into one LLC, going to another LLC, then being paid to multiple Biden family members. The product being sold here is political yes. access to Joe Biden. Yeah, and Hunter Biden established his international finance business six months after his father became vice president. And the two areas where he got the biggest deals in Ukraine and China, those deals only happened, Dinesh, once Joe Biden was explicitly appointed by Barack Obama as the point person for U.S. policy in those countries. This isn't a Hunter Biden scandal because ultimately Hunter is a bag man. Correct. Uh, he's really the funnel through which the funds go. Joe Biden's defenders now say Hunter was using Joe, but Joe was using Hunter. What kind of father uses his son like this? What's your understanding of what your son was doing for an extraordinary amount of money? I don't know what he was doing. I know he was on the board. I found out he was on the board after he was on the board. And that was it. You think that everything that happened was kosher? You know there's not one single bit of evidence. Not one little tiny bit. Isn't it true that as you have an emerging police state, you've got certain people who become above the law. When we first exposed this in 2018, the FBI approached me, we talked to them about our findings, we shared it. It was basically squelched by the FBI. The FBI had no interest at the senior level. It's a convenient arrangement. The FBI protects the crimes of the Democrats and the Democrats protect the crimes of the FBI. I noticed the police agencies, for example, aren't protecting Trump. Right. So when people say Trump is an authoritarian, I think to myself, wait a minute, what kind of an authoritarian is he <laughs> when his own FBI, right. his own DOJ, right. the police agencies are going after Trump, but they are rushing to surround and protect Biden from any kind of external scrutiny. 
So Trump isn't running the police state. In fact, he's running away from the police state. He's its main target. And now he's facing four criminal indictments with nearly a hundred charges. Today, an indictment was unsealed. The defendant repeatedly made false statements on New York business records. Conspiring to defraud the United States. From a criminal conspiracy to overturn the results of the 2020 presidential election. And conspiring and attempting to obstruct an official proceeding. They don't go after the people that rigged the election. They go after the people that want to find out what the hell happened. Modern tyranny maintains the facade of democracy. Russia, Venezuela, Iran, China all have elections, but they only tolerate a submissive opposition that does the bidding of their one-party state. He will surrender himself for processing at an overcrowded jail with a reputation for violence and neglect. Actually, three people have lost their lives over the last month. That jail is where the disgraced ex-president of these United States is heading right now. They go into the Capitol. Donald Trump and the MAGA Republicans. And that is a threat to this country. Here you see the Reichstag, the German House of Parliament in Berlin, which has been seriously destroyed by fire. Hitler, now Chancellor, has announced that the fire was the work of communists and was intended to be the signal for a Bolshevist uprising throughout the country. In consequence, Germany has been placed under a system of martial law. The 1933 Reichstag fire was a pretext for Hitler to declare a state of emergency. No more civil liberties, no more right to speak or assemble or protest. Hitler also began a violent crackdown on his political enemies. Donald Trump and the MAGA Republicans represent an extremism that threatens the very foundations of our republic. January 6th was the Reichstag fire incident. Someone tried to burn the German parliament. It was some foreign communist. But Hitler was able to manipulate that and use it to establish a regime of social control, of censorship. They've been waiting for this for decades. They were waiting for that moment where they could say, look, those are the bad guys. And it was almost like fertilizer for the media machine. And I knew the world would never be the same after that. This administration and the Department of Justice wants to make a statement using the full force of the FBI. And that statement is that if you attack our democracy, you will pay and you will pay dearly and you will be treated just like the terrorists that attacked us on 9-11. To some of you, these may seem like average Americans, but make no mistake, these are anti-government, anti-authority, violent extremists, and they must be treated as armed and dangerous. Joseph Bolanos is a New Yorker who went to Washington, D.C. on January 6th, but never went inside the Capitol. I went straight from Union Station to the Washington Monument. I could hear President Trump talking. I know that everyone here will soon be marching over to the Capitol building to peacefully and patriotically make your voices heard. And then we decided to go to see the Capitol. It was uh, filled with hundreds of thousands of people walking quietly, peacefully, people in wheelchairs, veterans, walking toward the Capitol. There were no barriers, no police, no signage. After we got on the grounds, which we didn't know we were on the grounds because there was no signage, and we saw people in the distance climbing the walls, and that's when we said, no, nah, something's wrong here. So we're not going any further, and we stopped. You come back to New York, then what happens? I went to my local cafe where I was showing my footage and telling people, look, this is what really happened. And then someone turned you in to the FBI as an insurrectionist. I was walking down the street and I overheard him bragging about having been there and having video. What's really scary about this is that in the 1930s, thousands, if not millions of Jewish families were rounded up and transported to their untimely death by neighbors that were doing the same thing. I mean, is that what we've become? I mean, one phone call from one guy can actually activate the FBI. 
at the time you were living in an apartment, but you also taking care of your old mom who recently passed away in her apartment. My mother at the time was staying at a rehab center. I was sleeping on her couch and at 6 a.m. I hear boom, boom, boom. I mean, really loud knocking. FBI, open the door, we'll knock it down. Boom, boom, boom. So I'm in my long johns and a t-shirt and uh, I get up, I go to the door, I open the door and hear about six to eight military style joint terrorist task force soldiers with the tallest one of them pointing an automatic rifle at my head. So they say, turn around, they handcuff me, they walk me down the stairs, they wouldn't let me back into the, the apartment. They started interrogating, I would think about 6.30 in the morning and around 10.30, I started to feel a little weak, I said, but not myself. And then I also saw the camera guy show up from NBC. Where the FBI Joint Terrorism Task Force was seen along Fort Washington Avenue, taking out bags of possible evidence. And that's when I started to panic because I said, this can't be on TV. I mean, what, what's, going, what's going to be said? What's going, you know? I mean, it's just destroy your reputation, right? Completely. In your community, and you've lived there a long time. Now, shocked and angry neighbors say they can't believe the head of their block association may have been involved in attacking the Capitol. And it's inexcusable. And I didn't know he had those views. And the combination of being restricted in a back seat for four hours, I think I just short-circuited. And I said, I need an ambulance. They took me to the hospital. You had a stroke? Yes. There were two FBI searches today at apartments linked to one man. They came to get you at your mom's apartment. They simultaneously went to your apartment. Yes, sir. And in fact, you had some video. I had two cameras because I'm a security person. So I had a regular doorbell camera. And you could see in the sequence that an FBI agent comes up. So he put a sticker over the lens of the ring camera. What he didn't know is that the peephole on the door was also a camera. If you have a legal search warrant and you're walking into a property, why are they neutralizing the cameras? Police, start fire! Start fire! Lock the corner, lock the corner! Go on the right, go on the right, clear! And they trash your mother's apartment. Oof. In fact, you've left it that way. Yes. It looked like a herd of cattle went right through the apartment. I mean, they ripped suitcases from the closets. They stepped on things that they broke. There's some things missing. My mother, thank God that she was in a rehab place because had she been sleeping that morning, it would have killed her. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I live in an old building and the pipes sometimes, they make noise in the middle of the night. I was getting up, freaked out, thinking, oh my God, are they back? The emotional stress is indescribable. You know, and try to find a lawyer that'll represent you for your rights when you're innocent. Fat chance. Either you have to give them a half a million dollars or they're scared of the courts. They're actually scared of the DC court and the Southern District Court. What kind of justice is that when you're innocent? Who do you go to? When you know... <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> when you know that you're innocent, <laughs> the only thing you have on your side is truth. Truth. And the knowledge that you're right, that they're wrong. I'm an American citizen. I had no reason to be uh, attacked. FBI, who's the hands? FBI! Face the wall! Hands up! Steve, one of the signature moves of the FBI is the FBI home raid. DOJ and HQ want the full song and dance here. Visual impact. Expect the media. You're all going to be on prime time. Mm -hmm. We want the subject on display. Doing the walk of shame. Chief Division Counsel and DOJ have approved a no-knock breach. Some of these people have dogs. Use deadly force if necessary. Any question? Now, is this because the guy in the house is uncooperative, dangerous, and has to be approached in this way? Or what is the rationale for doing this? 
We're back to the process being the punishment. Because the FBI wanted this exhibitionistic, domestic shock and awe, if you want to call it that. Agree 100%. Our elected officials have characterized January 6th as the worst event that has happened in the history of the country since the Civil War. Anyone with any ambition of promotion within the FBI is going to be tempted to get their hooks into January 6th to claim that they had some sort of supervising or managerial responsibility involved with it. And the individuals who are in charge of all the field offices around the country are receiving compensation in the area of thirty to fifty thousand dollars because their offices were successfully opening the adequate number of domestic terrorism cases. Because in this country, we are very fortunate that the domestic terrorism is not a significant threat. The demand for domestic terrorism amongst our elected officials and elite vastly outstrips the supply. And so the FBI, in a sense, obliges. It provides the supply. You manipulate the statistics to make yourself look good and get your commissions up. This is reminiscent of how officials in Nazi Germany justified their actions. I'm just following orders. I'm just trying to get ahead. The writer Hannah Arendt termed this the banality, meaning the ordinariness of evil. FBI, this is Steve. Steve, when you push back against your bosses at the FBI and you said that these people are not what you're portraying them to be, and in some cases there's no reason to open up an investigation at all, what were you told? My supervisors told me that I had a duty to the FBI, not an oath to the Constitution. Sonia, let me turn to you. You're part of this team of federal air marshals. We were there, helping to protect the things that matter most, our way of life. Prior to 9-11, the Federal Air Marshal Service only employed 33 air marshals, and their duties were to fly on international missions. After 9-11, they employed thousands of air marshals. There was a huge push, and we were looking for people that could take over an aircraft just like they did on 9-11. That was our original mission. What it has morphed into in the last couple of years is almost unrecognizable. Who we're following and what we're looking at now are individuals that were in the National Capital Region January the 3rd through the 7th in 2021. That is our number one mission. This pool of suspects is not limited to people who went inside the Capitol. It is everybody who went to D.C. during that window for whatever reason. That is correct. You did not have to go to the Capitol. You did not have to go to the rally. You could have been there for a job interview. You could have been there for a function. It does not matter. You were on the list. They'd been entered into a national security database as a suspected domestic terrorist. We're following grandmothers, we're following people in their 80s, we're following Afghan veterans who lost their legs in Afghanistan who are paraplegics. We're watching these people every day. There's an element of craziness here because doesn't the air marshal doing this know that this is stupid? They absolutely do, and they're disgusted by it. And the agency doesn't care because now they get to pump the metrics up that they're helping the FBI follow all these domestic terrorists across the United States. So Congress will give them more money to keep the homeland safe. You are in the rotunda of the United States Capitol. I mean, it's beautiful, the paintings. Well, there is the sign of the Declaration of Independence. That picture over there is George Washington. He's resigning his commission. Look at that. I mean, if there was an insurrection, insurrectionists burned buildings, they torched the place, they tried to bring it to the ground. They didn't touch any of it. Congressman Troy Nails of Texas is a former constable and sheriff. His book, The Big Fraud, contradicts the left's narrative about January 6th. Let's just say that the people in this building had complete possession of it. I mean, it seems to me they haven't taken over the U.S. government. They're not going to make laws. So the idea that this was somehow intended to be a government takeover isn't that on the face of it absurd? They weren't here to overthrow the government. If you were going to overthrow the government, what you'd come in is you would destroy the place. You would create... Well, you'd come in armed, for you starters. Would, yes, and you would create the same type of chaos they did in 2020 with total destruction. I was one of the last members to leave the House chamber 
on January 6th. I was at the back doors, the main doors leading into the chamber. I was protecting those doors. Ah, uh, the window there to the right is the window that Ashley Babbitt jumped through. Lieutenant Byrd was positioned over there on the left. And Ashley Babbitt fell back and died right there. Yes. I heard that shot that took Ashley Babbitt's life. She was posing a threat to United States House of Representatives. He had no clue what her intentions were. I had been yelling and screaming as loud as I was, please stop, get back, get back. I don't believe anybody heard him giving those commands. She didn't know there was a gun being pointed at her. He says he couldn't see her hands. He couldn't tell if it was a female. If that would have happened in the summer of 2020, with the riots we saw across our country, you would have been indicted within a week. January 6th was fueled by lies, targeted at the nation's process of collecting, counting, and certifying the results of the presidential election. It's almost like it was a political godsend for the Democrats. They shut down right away all talk of election fraud. Well, there were many of us, including myself. I knew I was going to object. We had several states in question. What does it say to the nearly half the country that believes this election was rigged if we vote not even to consider the claims of illegality and fraud in this election? And it will stand in recess until the call of the chair. We reconvened at 9 p.m. to go through the certification of the electors. What happened then, we never even questioned Georgia, we didn't question Wisconsin. We kind of lost the drive and the will. And maybe, just maybe, that was their ultimate goal. They got their way. Not only was the process shut down, you had senators come back, like Jim Lankford, and say, because of this, we need to go ahead and certify the election of Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. I no longer support an audit commission. And Joe Biden and Kamala Harris were certified about 3.20 a.m. on January 7th. The Trumpsters actually had no motive to stop the process because the process we're talking about is not certification, but was in fact the questioning of the election that the Trumpsters wanted. That's right. That's what Nancy Pelosi wanted shut down. Could it be that it's almost as if they wanted it to happen? The intelligence was there from the, the FBI Norfolk office sent information over here. And hey, listen, we got extremist groups coming here, white supremacist groups, high propensity for violence. The Capitol itself is, go is a target here. Two days before January 6th, we're in the Oval Office, President Trump initiates a conversation about January 6th. You know, look, it looks like there's gonna be a large amount of people in and around Washington, D.C., in the Capitol. Are you guys prepared to take that on? If you, the DOD, need it, you have my presidential authorization to utilize up to 10 to 20,000 National Guardsmen and women around America to augment law enforcement before we can deploy uniformed soldiers in the United States of America. You have to have the head of the local government make the request. President Trump authorized the National Guard. Mayor Bowser refused. Nancy Pelosi refused. The FBI refused to put up a no-climb fence. And we had intelligence from the intelligence community saying that there was gonna be thousands of people in and around the United States Capitol on that day. How could we have such a colossal failure with all of those facts lined up. Donald Trump did not finish speaking until 1.10 p.m. Thousands of people there. The first breach took place 15 minutes before Donald Trump was even done speaking. So that's why I lean more towards inside job, intentionally leaving the Capitol insecure, goading people into the Capitol. We need to go into the Capitol. Ray Epps caught on camera repeatedly urging people to go into the Capitol. The crowd thought it was so bizarre that the immediate reaction was to accuse him of being a fed. Fed, 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 fed. This wasn't just some one-off idea. He was a veritable where's Waldo. He was there, he was everywhere. But Trump's speech, evidently, which he ostensibly traveled across the country to go here wearing the Trump hat. It's that direction. And then he's just, by sheer coincidence, I'm sure, pre-positioned at the very decisive initial reach point. So 
who really breached. Ray Epps is up there. Ray Epps is at those bicycle racks. He's whispering into that one guy's ear. And within seconds, they breach that bicycle rack, and then they start moving on into the Capitol. Ray Epps' behavior initially was considered to be so egregious that he was one of the first 20 people that the FBI put on its most wanted list for January 6th. The next day, he was quietly taken off this most wanted list. The New York Times, which formerly featured Epps as part of the Day of Rage. We are going to the Capitol, it's that direction. Later came to do a fully dedicated puff piece on Ray Epps. The only January 6th participant that the New York Times will defend. The Bureau issued this statement, quote, Ray Epps has never been an FBI source or an FBI employee. But was he working for Homeland Security or one of the other government agencies? We don't know. And the government, including the January 6th committee, refuses to say one way or the other. Police states jealously guard their secrets. Every police state has political prisoners. Most of the political prisoners of January 6th raised legitimate issues about the 2020 election. They're paying the price for the Biden regime's manipulation of their protest. It's the Reichstag fire all over again. Most of these defendants have never been in trouble with the law. Mask on. When the FBI came knocking on their door, they let them in. They handed over their phones. I can't tell you how many times I said, why didn't you have a lawyer? Because I trust the FBI. There are dozens who are charged with obstruction, conspiracy, seditious conspiracy, who were denied bail repeatedly and held under pretrial detention orders. So I would be getting letters and phone calls from the jail, the DC Gulag, and they would be telling me what was happening to them. What was miraculous was they are singing the national anthem every single night at nine o'clock as a defiance that this government would not break them uh, and it would not break their spirit or their patriotism or their love of this country. There's just no comparison between what was happening to BLM and Tifa writers. Actually, nothing is happening to them. The riots at Lafayette Park, right outside of the White House at the end of May for days that prompted the lockdown of the White House. But the riot happened on federal property, Lafayette Square, and the assaults against police officers, Secret Service and Park Police are federal officers. Not only were all those charges dropped, this same Department of Justice blamed Park Police and Secret Service for being overly aggressive with those rioters. We're accustomed to thinking of this as a double standard. We assume the government should treat us equally under the law, but the police state operates on a single standard. It consistently protects its allies and goes after its critics. In this respect, police states are inherently lawless. It hurts no one more than me, having been on both sides as a public defender and a federal prosecutor, to see our law enforcement community act differently not based on the law and the facts, but based on the political scene that's being set in the media. December 7th, 1941, September 11th, 2001, and January 6th, 2021. 9-11 is nothing compared to January 6th. Mr. Perno, you recognize? Jerry Perna is the aunt of January 6th defendant Matt Perna. Jerry, what is your earliest memory of your nephew, Matt Perna? I remember the day Matt was born. He was an incredibly long baby, and um, he had this enormous head of black hair. Very inquisitive. He asked a lot of questions. He had a fascination with the American flag. As he grew older, was he very political? Matt was not into politics at all. He had strong conservative beliefs, but at the same time, Matt was a Bernie Sanders supporter for a while there. But when Donald Trump came on the scene, and I think it was that first debate with Hillary Clinton that sold Matt, this is not a politician, this is a businessman, and this country needs a businessman. 
Why did Matt go to D.C. on January 6th? Matt believed in his heart that it was going to be a celebration. He didn't go there with any intention of protesting or rioting. He thought he was going there to hear an announcement that the election was not certified. How did he get into the Capitol? Matt was in a crowd. People were pushing from all sides, and the crowd was moving closer and closer to the building. And as he got up there, he was in an open doorway, and he walked in. And how long was he in the Capitol? I believe it was 14 minutes. He never left the velvet ropes. He stayed within the rotunda. He was peaceful? Extremely. He didn't touch anything. And then 14 minutes later, he was out? He was out. Within that week, I saw a Facebook post that said there were people from January 6th whose, whose pictures were on the FBI website. So I clicked on the link and I started scrolling through the photographs and there's my, my nephew's picture. My heart sank. It just sank. What was Matt Perna charged with? Originally, he was charged with the misdemeanors of parading, disorderly conduct, what, shouting and... He didn't have any altercations with any police officers, so I've always assumed it was just the, the chanting of the USA. I'm assuming he didn't have a criminal record. No, he never had a parking ticket. Those who conspired with others to obstruct the vote count also face greater charges. The DOJ slapped the felony charge of obstruction of an official proceeding. There's no way he obstructed it because they evacuated the building at 2.15 and there was videotape of Matt still outside at 2.57. So he wasn't even in the building while they were in session. Now, what was the uh, psychological effect of this added felony charge? Suddenly he was this center of attention in a bad way. These nasty, racist, bigoted insurrectionists. A bunch of thugs insurrectionist, white supremacist, anti-Semites. These bastards. Traitors. His attorney told him the quickest way for this to be over was to plead guilty. So he pled guilty and his attorney told him that he was looking at six to 12 months in a federal prison camp. And he called me and he said, Aunt Jerry, I am gonna turn this into a positive. He said, I'm gonna use my degree and I'm gonna help others get their GEDs. They scheduled his hearing for his sentencing, and his attorney says they're looking to add an enhancement of terrorism at the sentencing hearing. Matt called me on the phone. He was sobbing uncontrollably. And he, he apologized to me for me losing all my friends because of him. And I said, Matt, they weren't my friends. I said, I love you and we're gonna get through this. He said, they're gonna put me in jail for a long time. I said, Matt, they're not gonna put you in jail. I was arguing with him. I said, let's just see what's gonna happen here. He said, I love you, Aunt Jerry. Friday late afternoon, I got a phone call from one of my brothers. And he said, Matt hanged himself in his garage. I will never, ever forget that moment. Ever. I came across the prosecutor's name and phone number in Matt's files. I said, I have one question for you. I said, where on earth did you come up with this terrorism enhancement? He says, well, let me just say, if Matthew could have just waited another month for the hearing, I don't think the terrorism enhancement would have stuck. And I said, don't you understand? It was the threat of the enhancement that actually killed him. You, in effect, pushed him off the ladder. I hope that you remember Matt's name and the role you played in killing him. His country failed him. I want everybody to know what happened to my nephew could happen to them or their son or daughter for speaking out. Police states are cruel. They destroy people and the families that love them, but they don't care. It's more important for them to shut us up if we speak out in the wrong way. Another characteristic of police states is censorship, the shutting down of views that undercut the official propaganda of the regime. 
vaccinated people do not carry the virus, don't get sick. Two-year-olds should have been required to wear masks. It would be child abuse for parents not to do that. We know the science. We know that masks work. The theory that the virus started due to a leak from a lab is extremely unlikely. Literally, the only people dying are the unvaccinated. And for those of you spreading misinformation, shame on you. If only we had a vaccine against BS. Everything you heard is false, and yet none of it was censored. Instead, people were censored across social media who challenged these lies. They told us it didn't come from a lab, it wasn't gain-of-function research, it wasn't our tax dollars. It looks like all three of those things are true. They told us the vaccinated couldn't get it, they told us the vaccinated couldn't transmit it, and they told us that this was the first virus in history where there's no such thing as natural immunity. All those things were false. What was wonderful during COVID? The vaccine? Don't you ask any questions, you got it? And put your mask on and shut up. What do they have in common? They both involve sovereignty over your own body. Because once you can break down the idea that you own your own body, you don't own your money, you don't own your kids, you don't own your health. The body, you have nothing else. COVID wasn't a myth, but it was used as a pretext for global censorship and also to justify the suppression of rights and liberties that typically occurs only in wartime. There are emergency powers the federal government has been living under for three years, but also each of the state governments. In Kentucky, our governor took over emergency powers. He forbid certain forms of travel. You had to be tested to travel. He forbid uh, church attendance. His powers are unlimited if we're not in session and we can't call ourselves back in session. The Democrats, they love emergency powers. In fact, we voted several times to end the emergency only to have Biden veto it. You know, when this pandemic ends, and it will end soon, we're not gonna go back to normal. The main tool of government censorship on COVID and many other issues was the social media platforms. Zach Voorhees is a whistleblower who worked at Google. Ryan Hartwig worked for a firm that does censorship reviews for Facebook. How much does Facebook know about you or me or anyone? Not only do they know more about you than your wife, they can predict your behavior. So they're almost omniscient. What if I told you that you can't clear your browser history that Google is storing on what you visit? From that information, they can develop a psychographic profile that predicts your behavior. People don't understand that when you're, you're using a free product, you're the product. Yeah, I'm assuming the reason you joined Google is you, you were attracted by the promise of the internet. Like when they went IPO, they put out a constitution. First one, don't be evil. But their second constitutional line was organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. And that's the reason why I joined the company was because I believed in that corporate vision. And then all of a sudden the wrong president got democratically elected and they threw all of that into the garbage. There'll be people who say Facebook, Google are private corporations. They have every right to decide what goes on their platform. Google's not a private corporation, they're a quasi-state actor, like they're giving backdoor access to the FBI. There's a government collaboration with these private corporations that are censoring at the behest of government. And that's clearly against the First Amendment of the Constitution. It's happening with all the big tech platforms. They're all working together. Like when, when Alex Jones was banned, they banned them on all the different platforms within five minutes of each other. How big is Facebook? How many people are on Facebook? A third of the population of the entire world, you know, three billion people, are interacting using Facebook as a platform. Facebook is spending $10 billion a year on content moderation. Let's talk about the mechanics of it. Do they yeah. operate with a list? Yeah, so Facebook does have a lot of lists. They have a hate figure list. And when I'm looking at a piece of content, deciding whether to take it down, I literally have to open up this PDF list and look and see if that person's name is on there. People on the right who are perhaps nationalists, there are clearly white supremacists on that list. Uh, but there are other people who are just conservatives. Who, who are, are just smeared as white supremacists. Right. Right? Right. And now what about left-wing extremists? They clearly told us that Antifa is not a hate group. What was the treatment at Facebook of Trump? So I was moderating content from March of 2018 to February of 2020. So this was during the time when they were attempting to take President Trump down. The most egregious was, you know, Trump was giving his State of the Union address and Facebook told us to look for hate speech coming from the State of the Union address. You know, Trump was talking about how these MS-13 members were animals 
and Facebook told us you can't call immigrants animals. He talked about South Africa, how they were taking land from homeowners, and Facebook told us that this was a dog whistle for white supremacists. I did a segment on my podcast about Kyle Rittenhouse. I was promptly notified that I had been demonetized on Facebook and that I would be in Facebook jail for a year because of supporting dangerous individuals. Rittenhouse was vindicated and then I appealed and they're like, no, because at the time we made the decision, that was our policy. And there's no recourse. Congress has decided that big tech has full immunity from the decisions that they make. Zach, let's talk about Google because to me, Facebook is scary, Google is even scarier. Google sees itself as a programmer of human beings. I found this in multiple slides throughout the company. They are 100% serious about believing that their users are programmable and we should believe when they say it. They're looking at their search engine as the avenue to drive social change within this country. They released a totalitarian system called machine learning fairness. They put it in design documents. They literally rewrote their news algorithm based upon what Trump was doing so they could get this guy. So I make a video. I use the expression crooked Hillary. Now what happens? Google is going to take the audio and use artificial intelligence in order to transcribe it into text. It's gonna be data mined by a bunch of other artificial intelligence. It's gonna detect that you said crooked Hillary and it's gonna apply, oh, this is like a right-wing content, right? When I was there, I saw about 48 different labels that were being applied. From the way that they categorize your data impacts whether you get shadow banned, whether you get demonetized, or whether your channel gets banned outright. There's no human intervention here so far. And what you've described, it's entirely the machines. Right, once they train the algorithms, then they can just unleash it at scale. It's an active collaboration between the police agencies of government and digital platforms. Are you getting tips and leads from Facebook and social media companies? We get tips and leads from companies, absolutely. Right. It's against the law for Facebook or social media companies to give it to you, but it's also against the law for you to receive it. Censorship is now a global operation. We partnered with Google, for example. If you Google climate change, you will, at the top of your search, you will get all kinds of UN resources. We started this partnership when we were shocked to see that when we Googled climate change, we were getting incredibly distorted uh, information right at the top. So we, we're becoming much more proactive. Um, you know, we own the science. Is it the case that we have a police state or an emerging police state that is a, an octopus spanning the government? the private sector, the nonprofit sector, academia, the media. The number one lawyer at the Federal Bureau of Investigation who signed off on the fraudulent Trump FISA warrant, James Baker. Is it a coincidence that he became the number one lawyer at Twitter? Is it a coincidence that the FBI under Chris Ray's leadership with James Baker at Twitter formed an 80 agent task force about elections? Let's be very grateful to Elon Musk for buying Twitter. Your free speech is meaningless unless you allow people uh, you don't like to say things you don't like. Otherwise, it's irrelevant. Um, and if at the point at which you lose uh, free speech, uh, it doesn't come back. They're not just deplatforming you. They are trying to throw people in prison. Douglas Mackey, who tweeted under a pseudonym on Twitter that was very entertaining. And he made the critical mistake of mocking Hillary Clinton. In that meme, Mackey suggests it's possible to vote for president by text message, because only Hillary voters could be stupid enough to believe something so absurd. The second Biden took office, the FBI swarmed his house. They arrested him, they booked him, and he was hit with a felony charge claiming that his satirical meme was disinformation. The arrest represents what could be a big change in how the federal government fights election interference. A young kid 
faces 10 years for it. If that's not a police state, I don't know what is. How many informants do you have in Catholic churches across America? Human sources to infiltrate. Is the police state targeting ordinary citizens? Are people not named Donald Trump? People who didn't go inside the Capitol on January 6th, nevertheless at risk of an FBI raid? They claimed that people who attend the Latin Mass in the Richmond field office, there was an intelligence product that goes out and says that those people are potentially white supremacists. It's because they disagreed with a pro-choice stance. They didn't like abortion. They wanted borders that were secure and therefore a legal immigration stance. And they were not particularly keen on the government getting involved in gay rights. If those are the big things that make you a so-called white supremacist or even susceptible to recruitment, that's not radical traditionalist Catholics that go to a Latin mass. That's all Christians and most conservatives, roughly half this country. I spoke to two pro-life activists, Mark Houck and Bevelyn Beatty Williams. You're in the street and you're trying to persuade women who are thinking about having an abortion not to do that. I've been coming to the clinics in Philly for, for 20 years. And I was there with my son, my 12-year-old son. Now you have uh, a guy from the Planned Parenthood. He's a volunteer. Right. But he came out and he beelined for me and my boy. He started talking to my son about me. Your dad's an evil man. Your dad's trying to hurt women. Now look, I can handle that, but I'm like, look, just leave him alone, right? Just you talk to me. So I just turned and I had this gut reaction. I, I pushed him. He did fall back. And, uh, and then he ran into the building. He filed a complaint against right. you. What happened to that? So it went to court and after four proceedings, it was dismissed. Then nothing happened. Dobbs is overturned June 24th. Then Joe Biden ends up in Philadelphia. We can restore the right to choose in this country by codifying Roe v. Wade and make it the law of the land. And then a pro-lifer start getting picked up and raided. September 23rd, it was a Friday morning. All the children are asleep. My wife's still in bed. There's a heavy banging at my door. Open up! If I was a normal citizen in Bucks County, you're gonna come to the door with your gun in your hand, right? Because that sounds like an intruder. Now, if I'm the federal government, I'm probably gonna announce that I'm the federal government or FBI so that no one gets hurt. Now, I think they didn't want to do that intentionally. My, my hunch. Because why else? They wanted you to come with a gun. Why, why else would you just bang on the door if you're the federal government and say, open up? So at this point, all the kids are awake. And I say, OK, stay calm. I have seven babies in this house. So I gently open the door and I show my hands. And I come out. And what I see is 15 marked and unmarked units on my property. Cars are surrounding my home. I got SWAT in the back of my house. They have two battering rams, they have ballistic helmets, ballistic shields, heavily armored vests, and all these long guns. At least 20 to 25 federal agents and state troops. So my wife's awake at this point. She's got her leopard bathrobe on and she's coming downstairs. And she says, do you have a warrant for his arrest? They said, well, we're taking him with or without a warrant. Kids are screaming at this point, freaking out. They're on the steps. Guns are now over the threshold of my home, pointed at my children, and they put me in belly shackles, feet shackles, and arrest, chained me to a table for six hours. But they had every intention to release me that day on my own recognizance. And what does that tell you? I'm not a threat to the community. I'm not a violent offender. I'm not a flight risk. Well, then why the show of force? If but to humiliate him. And and still fear in pro-life America. Did you get the eerie feeling as you went through this that you're living in a police state? I feel like it's Nazi Germany in the 1930s as they're rounding up those that are against the state or potentially against the state. And this is over an incident in which you pushed a guy and sure. so they accuse you of violating the so-called FACE Act. And the FACE Act essentially is you cannot interfere with somebody who is providing reproductive services at a reproductive clinic. Now, was he in fact escorting women into the clinic? No, no, he was harassing and badgering my son. That's all he was doing. So the FACE Act would appear not to even be applicable here. You weren't blocking people from trying to get into the clinic. What was the charge and what were you facing? Two violations against the FACE Act. And uh, that, that held 11 years in federal prison. Uh, $350,000 fine. Mark, you took it to trial, you put it before the jury, and what happened? It took less than an hour to deliberate. Unanimous verdict, not guilty on both counts. I said, I thanked the judge, and uh, he said, no, thank you, Mr. Houck. So I think he knew that 
it was going to be an important case law for my friend here. Evelyn, I saw a video in the protests over George Floyd. You had Black Lives Matter in New York. And so what did you do and why? I did the same thing they did. They decided to pivot their agenda using Blacks. So I decided to counter it because I'm Black. They painted Black Lives Matter. Nothing else matters until Jesus matters. And so that's why I did that. Let's talk about your pro-life ministry, because like Mark, this is a passionate cause for you. What drove that decision? 2019, Governor Cuomo decided to legalize abortion up until nine months. Until birth. Till birth. We're gonna preach the gospel and we're gonna make it known what you guys are doing. Right? So we were doing that for months on end. I mean, we, we had it so set. They would open at 7. We were there at 6.30. So we're standing in front of the door, and I guess at some point a girl opens the door and her hand gets shut in the door. She blames that on me. Now I'm facing 15 years for someone's hand getting caught in the door. She's accusing its members of invading reproductive health care clinics, threatening staff, and terrorizing patients. The police state is not new for Blacks. When you look at the police state of the Black community back then, you see it from a form of breaking down the family and then caging the youth, right? And that's really a test dummy to what they want to do to the entire nation. For me, I never thought it was about Black. We were just the scapegoats. It's really about the Christian. And do you think in the end it's because the Christian has an allegiance to something other than the all-powerful state? You can't have God in communism because that dictator or that leader has to be God. So now, as long as they can lock us up and shut us up and shut our voices down, they believe everybody else will just go with it. Pro-life activists are in the crosshairs of the police state. What about moms who protest at school board meetings? Sharona Bishop is a mom in Colorado. Stacy Langton is a mom in suburban Virginia. Moms and activism. Why is that important to you? Well, I think there's nobody better to stand up and fight for our children than a mom. It's just your instinct to protect your kids. And I, I think it's bizarre that it has changed so fast in our country that the state really believes they have the authority over my own child. Didn't this really get jump-started because of COVID? I'm at home and I can actually eavesdrop or get a little window into what they're trying to put into my child's head. COVID was a catalyst for the regular parent to recognize that the school system is failing our kids miserably. I will be telling both my boys not to wear masks. Thank you. And then you realize, wait a minute, <laughs> I'm sorry, there's pornography in the school library. Both of these books include pedophilia, sex between men and boys. We have perverts that are perverting our kids. You should be embarrassed and ashamed with the agenda that all of you are letting happening in this town. We learned that they were doing comprehensive sex education, radical sexualizing of children, and they shouldn't be. Then we realized they were having vaccination clinics on site and shouldn't be without parents' consent. There were all of these things happening. Parents were educating themselves. They were showing up. They didn't just one day go to a school board meeting. They were calling the teachers. Then they were calling the principal. Then they were going to the administrators. And finally, no one would listen to them, so they went to the school board. These are my kids, and I'm fighting for my kids. You were not alone in starting to say, I'm going to start asking some questions. I'm going to start showing up at some meetings. I'm going to stand here until my time is restored and my time is finished. A letter was written by the National School Board Association to the Biden administration, and it talks about America's public schools and education leaders are under an immediate threat. And it says that the school board association asks for federal law enforcement and other assistance to deal with these threats. Basically, they were calling for, let's try to see if we can criminalize what these moms are doing. Let's put them under surveillance. By November of 2021, that's when things really heated up. The NEA had released their statement. The FBI was gonna collude with them to come after parents as domestic terrorists. I'm a stay-at-home mom, right? And I was told by a retired Secret Service agent that I had a threat tag on my name from that DOJ task force memo. 
on the school board meeting on Thursday night, we had a lot of ghost cars there. <laughs> They're unmarked vehicles and they have specialized capabilities. We also had a marked DHS vehicle pull up right in front of our protest. We also had a helicopter. It's a frightening thought to think that my government might want to come and arrest me for doing nothing other than exercising my right to free speech. Will FBI agents be attending local school board meetings? No, FBI agents will not be attending local school board's meetings, and there's nothing in this memo to suggest that. What about you, Sharona? Did the police agencies of the government retaliate against you? On November 16th of 2021, my two little boys were sitting at the table doing their school, 9.30 in the morning, and we're doing our, doing our routine, doing our day. At 9.30, we start hearing this banging on the door. FBI, warrant! Come to the door now! FBI, warrant! Come to the door now! And my little ones looked at me. I, you know. They took a battering ram to my door. And they blew the door open. Yeah, yeah. They pulled me out the door and took my phone immediately and put me in handcuffs. My daughter was 18 at the time, and they grabbed her by her hoodie, pulled her down the stairs by her hoodie. This six foot five FBI agent just uh, manhandling her. The whole streets roped off like we're criminals, like we are domestic terrorists, like we're doing something wildly, horribly illegal in our home. The violation is pretty intense. They see everything, every nook and cranny. When I was standing out there with them, we discovered there was agents from four different states. You know, we can't get that many agents to come down and investigate child sex trafficking. If they're coming for me, they're coming for you. Migrants breaching the country. A strange and disturbing consequence of our police state can be seen along our southern border. Aaron Stevenson served as an intelligence analyst at the Department of Homeland Security. Tara Rodas worked in the Child Placement Division of the Department of Health and Human Services. Typically, when you think of police states around the world, they have a closed border. How do you explain the fact that our emerging police state has an open border? What do you think is the underlying motive here? There is a very strong border when it comes to, you know, fruits and vegetables or manufactured goods. You can't just bring in like a fake Nike shirt and go sell it in a store. That is controlled. People is wide open. That land border is wide open. So I definitely think that they need people in the system to keep the system moving. They need bodies, but they want bodies with democratic sign on them. And the Biden regime becomes the guys who say, hey, listen, we're the ones who are opening the door. We're letting you in. You owe us. So we're gonna count on a long-term benefit for the Democratic Party. Exactly. Tara, what did you discover when you were at HHS? That children are being trafficked through a sophisticated network to the United States and then distributed throughout the country to bad actors. They are putting the children in labor trafficking and sex trafficking. When I volunteered to help the Biden administration with the crisis at the southern border, as part of Operation Artemis, I was deployed to the Pomona Fairplex Emergency Intake Site to help reunite children with sponsors in the United States. At the Pomona Fairplex Emergency Intake Site, the contractor earned $51,000 a month processing the children. The program says it's a family reunification program, and that's not what I discovered at all. I saw there were apartment buildings where there were 40 children going. We found children who sadly were sponsored by an older man. They were teen girls. We found a girl who we thought we sent to her brother. And next thing, she's for sale on the internet. So I've sat across from case managers. One told me, she said, the little boy that I just processed, he's only eight. He came across Mexico being prostituted the whole way. He's in diapers now because of how many times he was abused en route. Who's applying to get that kid and how are they able to get through this vetting process? The people who are vetting the sponsors, they're not criminal investigators. They don't have backgrounds in fraud. How much vetting can be done 
when you're moving 8,300 children in less than six months. It was speed over safety. What in fact happened when you reported it? I was threatened with investigation. I was walked off the site by the federal field specialist and security. And of course they do this in order to put a chilling effect on the other case workers and case managers. Let me turn to you, Aaron. You worked at the Department of Homeland Security. So I joined DHS in September 2012. I would monitor transnational organized criminals when they come in the country or anywhere near the country. I would receive um, every record of every encounter of all of these Watch Us aliens. So we know who they are, where they're at, and what they're doing. And the first time I came across a record exposing one of these criminals trying to get a child through this program was in February 2021. This is a pattern. There, there is something here indicating there's actually more. I see there's trafficking in the program, but I have no idea that transnational criminal organizations are getting the children. This is MS-13, 18th Street Gang, uh, Romanian organized crime group. And these guys are coming from El Salvador, Honduras, Mexico, Romania. Over 85,000 children are missing. 85,000 children in two years are gone. So the Biden regime wants a largely open border to help create a political majority. They need the political majority to build the police state. And if they have to look the other way while children are trafficked by cartels and crime organizations, so be it. This is the callousness, the inhumanity of the burgeoning police state. So far, we've been talking about a police state in the U.S., but now we consider a disquieting question. Is it possible that we're seeing elites trying to build a police planet? You'll hear the word conspiracy theory banded about. Say, oh, conspiracy theory is like the Great Reset. And I always point out to people, it's interesting because I didn't make that term up, uh, the guy who runs the World Economic Forum, Klaus Schwab, wrote a book called The Great Reset. I see the need for action. I see the need for a great reset. The video that they had, which is that you'll, you'll own nothing. You'll own nothing. And you'll be happy. Certainly within the Anglosphere and within even the broader West, there's a hyper-ideological version of a police state that's animated by wokeness. Now, there's another police state, China, that is very different. We're becoming China plus drag queens. We're police states of a different variety. You can say things in China that would get you fired, if not worse, in the United States. Conversely, in the United States, you can say things that would get you imprisoned or worse in China. China is a police state, but at least you can see they're getting something from their lack of freedom. And the Chinese are offering a bargain to their citizens. We'll take away all your rights, but you're going to see your standard of living generally and speedily improve. And so at least we're offering you a deal. We're getting the worst of all worlds. China, as people more or less know, that she is in charge. The police state in America has an opaque quality to it. It's not clear who really is in charge. If I could make an arrangement, a uh, stand-in, a front man, they had an earpiece in and I was just in my basement in my sweats, then I could sort of deliver the lines, but somebody else was uh, doing all the talking and ceremony, wow. I I'd be fine with that. At the very end of a New York Times article, Obama made a statement where he basically said that he envied the leadership of China. A lot of leaders in the United States that have ambitious plans and they're frustrated by the fact that we have checks and balances and owe oh, this document called the Constitution that gets in their way. And they're envious of China. Admiration I actually have for China um, because their you know, basic dictatorship is allowing them uh, to actually turn their economy around on a dime and say, we need to go green as fast as we need to start, you know, investing in solar. The Chinese have a strategy, which is a social credit system. And there are actually people in the United States, in government and elsewhere, who think the social credit system is not a bad idea. 
Everywhere she goes, Oh Young Hao Yu is followed. What she buys, how she behaves, is tracked and scored. Facial recognition, body scanning, and geo tracking, matched with your personal data and online behavior, will power the social credit system. Pushes you to become a better citizen. Good social credit gets rewarded with perks like cheap loans and travel deals. But a bad score means public shame and worse. Video of offenders is shown on the local news. Plastering their details, even their addresses across big screens. And information collectors like Joe I. Nee are paid to report on their neighbors. Her quota, 10 entries a month. You get caught jaywalking in China, you lose social credit score points. You didn't get your vaccine and you're not allowed in certain places. We already have de facto proxies like that developing here. You combine that with CBDCs, central bank digital currencies, where they can watch every dollar you spend. And then you combine that with artificial intelligence, facial recognition technology. Now you've got a real problem. It's in effect Gulag 2.0, right? We don't need the camps. We can use surveillance state electronic power to basically monitor people and control their behavior. You know, I've often said that when I read 1984 the first time, it wasn't two-way television screens and all the way the government was going to spy on you and surveil you. And I was like, eh, well, we don't have all that. We have all of that now. Science is replacing evolution by natural selection with evolution by intelligent design. Not the intelligent design of some god above the clouds, but our intelligent design and the intelligent design of our clouds. The IBM cloud, the Microsoft cloud, these are the new driving forces of evolution. Tyrants disarm the people they intend to oppress. Your book, Yan Mi, is titled While Time Remains. As an outsider, you're warning America that, look, you still have time to prevent this police state. So I don't think any nation can ever be like North Korea if they had a right to bear arms and protect themselves from the government. But to me, American last battle is gonna be always guns. Biden even explicitly says things like, what's the point of you having a gun or me having a gun because the government has bigger guns and the government has nuclear weapons. We think about the recent push by the Biden administration and others to start to get a central repository for all of these ATF records for gun sales. What do you think they're doing that for? They're doing that because the people you want to go for first are the people with the guns, obviously. I mean, it's a tried and true 12-step plan for tyranny. If you look through human history, when you have a disarmed populace, that's when civil liberties are most a threat. No police state is complete until it disarms its citizens. And in this respect, the Second Amendment isn't just another right, it's the guarantor of last resort of all our rights. Let's find a way to shut him down. Yes, sir. Where do we run to? It's not nowhere to go. This is the last hope for the humanity. So how bad can it get? You won't be able to speak. You won't be able to spend your money. You won't be able to send your kids to the school you want. What's next, religion? Jesus said, if they hate you, remember they hated me first. If they persecute me, they'll persecute you also. We are living in a world that seeks to suppress and distort the truth of God's word. Amen. Amen. But I have good news. See, God's word carries inherent authority and no one can suppress or diminish its power. The book of Isaiah says that every word that... FBI, we have an arrest warrant. Put your hands on your head, put your heads down. FBI, hands on your heads, put your heads down. Calm down. Collins, we are here for you. I'm right here. Put your hands straight up. I am not resisting, I'm right here. Turn away from the sound of my voice. Get on your knees. On What's your going knees. on here? You can't do this. This is the house of God. Shut him up. You're violating our constitutional rights. Get him out of here. We have freedom of religion and freedom of speech. America will be a full-fledged police state when the country itself has been turned into a prison. 
In a free country, the government exists to serve the citizens. In a police state, the government declares war on the citizens. All right, call the radio room. We got one in custody. And you won't be able to hide. They have their lists, and you are already on one of them. You may be next. Let's go! Let us pray, let us hope, let us work together to stop and roll back our emerging police state. Go. And in solidarity with the political prisoners of January 6th and political prisoners everywhere, let us join in singing this great anthem of liberation. Fight or you gon' fold. How will they remember? 